Alejandro Miguel San Martin, MIG, as we call him. Uh, MIG was born in a, uh, in a Patagonian ranch house uh, in internal exile during political unrest in Argentina. He left Argentina at 17 years of age without speaking a word of English to come to the U.S. and study to be an engineer and work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And that's exactly what he did. Now, I love many things about Miguel, and he's a close personal friend and genius behind our landing system. But perhaps what I like the best about him is his uncanny ability to cut to the essence of a problem and find solutions that are truly very simple. Anne Devereaux, she is sort of a self-styled, tough as nails, shoot you as soon as look at you, system engineer. But inside that tough exterior is really a heart of gold and a woman who cares deeply about the people on our team, especially those most vulnerable. She can also drink whiskey like a sailor. <laughs> Richard Kornfeld. Richard came from Switzerland to the US at, at 27. Uh, Richard is somebody that from afar might seem like he's not easy to like. Very structured, very rigorous, and a little rigid. But once you get to know him, you realize his heart is in the right place, and his motive is nothing but good, and he wins you over. Alan Chen, the team's boy wonder. Alan's entire career, professional career, has been on this team with us. We call him sometimes Data for his <laughs> uncanny capacity to remember everything. Now, I could go on about the team forever, and there's a lot of them. Suffice it to say, I was privileged to work with an incredible group of people building a rover to go to the surface of Mars. To help all of you, this nation, explore our universe. I love Teddy Roosevelt quotes. I love this Teddy Roosevelt quote the best. Far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is a chance to work hard at work worth doing. Exploring our universe, following our curiosity, is such work worth doing. It stretches us, it extends us as individuals, as a nation, and as a people. When we explore, we're really asking questions about ourselves. How grand are we? What questions might we dare ask and hope to answer? When we explore, we're wondering at the edges of us. And that is work worth doing. Now, there's another feature to work worth doing. If it's big work, if it's grand work, if it's great work, it requires many people coming together to make it happen. That great work requires those people is another true gift that life has to offer us. So I want to talk today about the work, going to Mars, landing a rover, and the people, and how we came together to do it. First, let's talk about Mars. For eons, humans have stared up at the sky and wondered about the stars and the planets around us. We've looked at that big red dot in the sky, and with telescopes, we've seen all sorts of things. We envisioned canals and roadways. We've been certain that life was there, or have always wondered if life could have been there. We were asked to help answer that question by putting a rover on Mars. And not just anywhere on Mars, a particular place. Gale Crater, a huge crater near the equator, that rhymes, of Mars, as big as the Big Island of Hawaii. And in the center there, a huge mountain, Mount Sharp, 15,000 feet tall. That's taller than anything in the Rockies or the Sierras, anything in the continental US. We were charged with putting a rover 
down there beside the crater wall between the mountain and the crater. To do that, we were going to have to innovate. We're going to have to do better than we had ever done. This is a shaded topographical relief map of the landing site. You can see the orange high areas in that ring and the mountain in the center. To land down there in that safe blue spot, we are going to have to be more accurate than any previous expedition to Mars. We are going to have to hit the target on the bullseye. And when we hit that bullseye, we weren't just going to land any rover, we were going to land the biggest rover we've ever taken to another planet. In 1997, we proved we could put a rover on the surface of Mars. In 2004, we put a pair of rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, at Mars, and they discovered that in the past of Mars, there had been liquid water. Now, that is incredibly important to us because we know from here on Earth that where there is life, there is water. With no water, no life. So demonstrating that water had been on the surface, very important to help us understand if life could have ever been at Mars. They couldn't tell us how long the water had been there, what the salinity or the pH may have been. In short, whether that primordial Martian environment was habitable for life. Enter Curiosity. She's 900 kilograms, five times as, as big as any rover we've put down and packed with equipment to tell us if Mars had been, or is today, habitable for life. But landing her was hard. It was tough. And it was going to require us to change everything. These are the four things you always have to do if you want to go to the surface of Mars. <laughs> you show up moving really, really fast, 10,000, 15,000 miles an hour, you're wrapped in a cocoon that protects you from the intense heat of entry. That slows you down a while, but not enough. You open up a parachute. The parachute, 1,000 miles an hour, takes you down to about 100 miles an hour, but that's not enough. You need to go ultimately to rockets. The rockets will slow you down to basically parking speed, but then you've got to do that last graceful embrace with the Martian surface somehow in that last touchdown system. Well, curiosity and putting her inside Gale Crater meant we were going to have to innovate and change every single one of those components. So how did the team do that? What guided our attempts to innovate, to create a better way of getting to Mars? This sounds easy to say and grand to say, and it's probably a good idea for all of us to search for the truth. But what I mean in particular is that the team needed to look for the engineering truth in what we were doing. And why we needed to do that was because for a system such as this, we cannot test it. We cannot analyze it completely. At the end of the day, we have to rely upon our engineering judgment to understand if we've made the right design choices and that we understand the risks. That judgment means we must be very reverent of the truth and protect ourselves against self-delusion. So we needed a team hungry for the truth and ready to let go of their own investment in the ideas or concepts that they may have, which might cloud their judgment. So how do we do that? I don't have a recipe for you. Um, what I tried to do as the leader was to offer my own ideas up for attack, to try and engender a culture within the team that was very respectful of individuals, but uh, very aggressive with ideas. We wanted to get rid of the bad ideas. We wanted to be left with the good ideas, and who the good idea came from doesn't really matter. Because in the end, the author of an idea dies. But the idea, if it's good, can live forever. An example of that, perhaps, is our landing system. So three of these landing systems, the airbags, the legs, and this pallet down here, all had various advocates, persons who felt invested in part or whole of the system. And we investigated each of them and tried to make it work. But after exhausting that, we had to come together 
and let go of our individual ownership of the pieces to finally and collectively invent something that was none of us and all of us. Well, that's how we innovated, but even that creative process was not linear and perfect. There were setbacks. Her sheer size meant we would struggle. Remember that uh, cocoon I talked about, the one that protected us from the intense heat of entry? This is a test of the material that protects us done at Ames, just up the road. And it's supposed to look like that. It's supposed to glow and flow. It's beautiful. We've used that system many times before, and it was my idea to use it again. It's not supposed to look like that. <laughs> That's it burning through. That's death at Mars. So when the team faces a setback like that, a bad idea that didn't get killed by the team was allowed to, to move forward. When the team faces a setback like that, how do they handle it? Well, there's two approaches, two pieces to it. One, there's the technical, that's the easy. You regroup, you learn from your lesson, and you find a new solution. But until you find that solution, you're in an emotional void. You're in what we call, at work, the dark room. <laughs> and you don't know if there's a way out of the dark room. So what do you do emotionally? The answer, at least for us, is for our team, the thing that evolved in our community was you can't get too wrapped around the axle about it. You got to let go. You got to lighten up. You got to develop a culture of play. And that's exactly what we did. We took time to be with one another, to enjoy each other's company, maybe drink a little wine. And that bonded us together in those hard times better than any bonding in the good times. And meant that we were resilient to the stress that we would face when we were struggling. So how did this all come together in the end? What did it look like? Coming up on the tree. The able reports that trade face. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. The vehicle's just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. We have seen peak deceleration. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. The parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Each chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of 1 kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. He remains strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. So this is that wonderful team that I had a chance to work with looking at this. For me personally and for the team, this is the emotional payoff of landing night. The ones and zeros, the data that comes down that tells you you've done a good job are abstracted. This, a new image from a new place in our universe, is what we do it for and what really fills us. So I want to leave you tonight with a couple of images. They're murky images taken from what will remain as an unnamed bar <laughs> near the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, they are taken packed to the gills, way past fire marshal rules, and staying open until the morning light. 
the Bachnalian exuberance that was expressed that evening, including, including uh, henna tattoos of the sky crane system, uh, will live in my memory forever. But this last image, which is an image that I took with my iPhone from on top of the bar, <laughs> as I tried my best to express what was in my heart, but failed. I look at this and I am remember, I remember and I am brought to realize that, that the fact that many people have to come together to do a great work is in fact a great gift of life. And my own participation in this community and my own hopeful contributions to it will remain for me as a gift to the end of my days.